great. Okay, thank you all for coming. So, uh, just to uh, get right into it, my, uh, what I wanted to do today is uh, go kind of go back to the basics a bit and basically give a more kind of fun, uh, a, a description of not so much the product of uh, Ethereum research, but more the process that we've been taking over the last uh, a, a couple of years in order to try and figure out you know, what kinds of pro protocols should we actually be building. So you know, if we want to design a proof of stake algorithm or if we want to design an algorithm for sharding or even something higher level, like if you're building some, uh, some kind of decentralized oracle, you know, what methodology would you use in order to figure out whether or not it's safe? Right. So, in general, the way that I think, I mean, both myself and, and many other people in the Ethereum research community think about this kind of general notion of crypto economics is that it's about using a collection of cryptographic and economic building blocks in order to build systems that have certain desirable information security properties. Right. So. Basically, you can use cryptography in order to prove uh, properties about messages that happened in the past. And you can use economics. You can use economic incentives defined inside of a system in order to encourage uh, certain desired properties of that system to hold into the future. Right? So cryptography is kind of backward looking and economics is forward looking. So just to go through a quick example. If we look at you know something like Bitcoin, basically it has a few desired properties, right? And what and you can, you can think of these desired properties at many different levels, right? So for example, at a higher level, you can think of it as being you know, to, existing to provide peer-to-peer -peer digital currency. But at a lower level, you can think of the system as existing to create a chain of blocks, to in, to include transactions that users send into those blocks to maintain this notion of state. And in Bitcoin, the state is called a UTXO set, but you can think of the state as just representing how much money everyone has. And to transactions affect the state. So there's a function that takes an old state, applies a transaction to it, and gives you a new state. So for example, if the old state says that I have 500 Bitcoins and Vlad has 100 Bitcoins, a transaction is that I send Vlad 10 Bitcoins. The new state is that I have 490 Bitcoins and Vlad has 110 Bitcoins. That, that makes sense to everyone? Great. Okay, so, and also another kind of uh, much smaller function of Bitcoin, but one that does still technically exist and is in there is to maintain a clock. Right? So blocks contain timestamps, and these timestamps are in theory supposed to, uh, at least uh, within some uh, bound reflect reality. So f from a kind of very low level standpoint, these are kind of properties that we want the Bitcoin blockchain to have, right? So. You can, think, you can also think of the, the, the properties in this way. So you can think about convergence. So convergence basically, a perfect ideal convergence says that you have new blocks that get created, new blocks get added onto the existing chain, but blocks do not get replaced and blocks do not get removed. Um, validity. So only transactions that specify a certain predicate valid, so it'd be a predicate that takes as input the state and the transaction, with respect to the state at the time of execution should be included in a block. So what does this mean? Uh, so basically, let's say that I now have 490 Bitcoins and I decide that I am going to send 400 Bitcoins to Mihai. Then that transaction with respect to the current state should be valid. Now let's say the transaction gets executed. Now, after the transaction gets executed, because I sent Mihai 400 Bitcoins, I have 90 Bitcoins left. With respect to the new state, me sending 400 Bitcoins is no longer valid because I don't have enough money anymore. So a similar transaction should not be allowed to be included a second time. Right? So that's one example of what validity means. And with respect to the clock, the clock should be roughly increasing, is one kind of desideratum, and the clock should also reflect reality. Right? Now, uh, data availability. So this is another fairly important one. And this is one that we kind of think about a bit less, but it's one that's really important. Basically, it should be possible to download the full data associated with a block. Right? So you could imagine, you know, if uh, a, a, a mining cartel really wants to, it could start mining a chain of blocks where all of the blocks are completely valid, 
but the cartel only publishes the headers to the blocks. It doesn't publish anything else in the blocks, and all the rest of the data just keeps to itself. You know, this actually would be a failure of the system because no one else would actually know what the state is, and that's bad. But you know, like this is one kind of failure mode that you do want to take into account, right? So, like in the case of Bitcoin, basically it solves this uh, through the, the kind of the in you know, one way is the through the full node protocol. So as a full node, you only accept blocks that you can personally download everything and verify and do everything. Or with the like node protocol, it kind of implicitly trusts a minor majority. Um, availability. So basically, the states that if you send the transaction, then the transaction should be able to get quickly included if it pays a sufficiently high fee. Now, as people who have followed the Bitcoin blockchain for the last couple of weeks know, sufficiently high fee. Mm, but you know, basically, the point is that if I have a bunch of, you know, if I have a transaction and it really, really wants to get, get, get it included, the system should not kind of discriminate against me. The system should not just like not allow anything to get in. So like, there are a bunch of behaviors that would be really, really bad. Um, now, this actually gets very important if you start going into kind of, if people start heavily using things like second layer architectures, because if you think about something like a channel-based system, you know, something like the Lightning Network, payment channels, Raiden, then any uh, a violation of availability in this sense, so a, a censorship attack, can be fairly translated into a theft attack on the channel system, right? So basically, especially if you know the Bitcoin community starts going in that direction, this is important. Um, so you know, this is what a blockchain looks like. You have timestamps, you have nonces. Um, in the real world, the, the prev hashes have uh, 32 bytes; they they don't have six bytes, and transactions. So cryptography, right? So there's um, in Bitcoin you have basically three forms of cryptography. So you have proof of work, which is a kind of, you can think of it as a kind of mathematical puzzle solution that, that probabilistically proves that you have access to some amount of computing power. Um, signatures, proving the authenticity of the transaction sender, and hashes. And hashes in Bitcoin serve two purposes. One of them is to ensure the kind of consistent total ordering of the chain. So, you know, you can't kind of swap blocks in and out of the middle of the chain without making the chain kind of not self-consistent anymore. And they also serve this function in the, like, in the, the Merkle tree that points to all the transactions where basically they create this, this data structure that is kind of efficiently auditable in, in a certain sense and where you can efficiently prove um, inclusion of certain transactions in the tree. So incentives in Bitcoin, basically you have, you know, the, the incentives are fairly simple. The miner of a block gets a reward of 12.5 BTC. Right now, if uh, they get if they get that block included in a trans, if they get uh, that block included in the chain, and the miner also has the ability to kind of extract an economic rent because the miner is in, in, in some sense a temporary dictator over the right to include transactions in the chain for uh, during the, the scope of that one particular block that they are creating. Um, my, the, the miner of a block that doesn't get into the chain gets nothing. And there is a, a, because of difficulty adjustment rules, it's also important to note that there is this property that rewards in the Bitcoin blockchain are marginally a long run zero sum, right? So if you can make other people ha get less money, then, you, that, then that translates into a kind of one for one ability for you to get more money. And this is in some ways the source of the selfish mining attack. So cryptography. So if, let's uh, think about the kind of cryptographic toolbox that we have more broadly, right? So the first thing that we have is hashes. So the purpose of hashes is to prove the topological order of messages. Now, what do I mean by this? Basically, topological order, you can think of it as a kind of partial ordering. So if A includes the hash of B, then A came after B. Right now, topological order is partial because you could have two objects where neither of them is kind of contains the hash of the uh, of the other, and so you can't really tell kind of which one came first. But in other cases, you do have an order, right? So if A contains the hash of B, that means that A can, came after B. If A contains the hash of B and B contains the hash of C, then A is after B and B is after C, and so by transitivity, A is after C. 
So like the, and because based because of like one one of the kind of properties of hash algorithms is that you can't create kind of cyclic cyclic graphs of you know things pointing to other things that point to other things that point back to the first thing, and so you know let's say cyclic and you have an order. Now signatures, um, signatures. Uh, also, I should point out that hashes, aside from topological ordering, they also have this important function that they allow a small piece of data to kind of stand in for a much larger piece of data. And if you verify something about a small piece of data, then that allows you to kind of verify a claim about a larger piece of data as well. Um, signatures are about verifying the authenticity of the sender. Um, and zero-knowledge proofs basically prove arbitrary computable predicates on messages. So basically what this means is that if you have, you have some private piece of data or some public piece of data and you want to prove something about it, so you want to prove that some computation on that data leads to some output, then you can do that. The proof can be efficiently verified and people can be convinced that even if your original data is private, that you actually do know a number that, that if you send it through this computational process, has some output. So that's another tool in the toolbox. Uh, we also have more exotic stuff, right? So for example, proof of work, which is a kind of probabilistic proof that you have access to a certain amount of expected computational power. Um, erasure codes. So erasure codes basically, their original usage is in redundant backups where you know if you have a one gigabyte file, then you can turn it into chunks where the chunks add up to two gigabytes. But any one gigabyte out of those two gigabytes can be combined, combined together and you can and recover the original file. But over in the context of uh, blockchains, you can think of it as a way to turn a 100% data availability requirement into a 50% data availability requirement. Right? So if you publish a block, then you know, for the block to be available, you would have to be able to download the whole thing. But if you publish an erasure coded block, then as long as the erasure coding is done correctly, 50, anything of a 50% or more of that data basically satisfies as a stand-in for the original block. Um, time lock crypto. So, or some, what I sometimes call sequential proof of work. Basically, you can prove that some amount, some amount of time passed between message A and message B. Right, so I mean, first of all, it, it proves that B is topologically after A, but it also proves this extra thing about timing. Um, homomorphic encryption and obfuscation. So basically, you can convert functions into functions that have that that are isomorphic, but that kind of have more privacy-preserving properties. So those those are some basically kind of the crypto tools that we have to work with right and if you're going to build systems that rely on these tools you don't even necessarily need to deeply know uh, know and understand how they work but it is kind of good to understand uh, abstractly what what properties those functions have and kind of what they're for so economics what do we have so there's actually two kinds of in, in, um incentives that we crypto economics can assign Right, so one kind of incentive is a token. So a token, basically, you can incentivize actors by assigning them units of a protocol-defined cryptocurrency. So a protocol where that protocol itself defines the, a cryptocurrency, and the protocol itself has control over that cryptocurrency's balances, it can use that cryptocurrency, provided that that cryptocurrency has value, to incentivize things. Now you can have rewards, you can make balances go up, you can have penalties, you can have balances go down. But like in general, people would rather have more tokens than less tokens, and you can use this to kind of drive people towards certain behaviors. A second kind of incentive, and one that we probably talk about less, is privileges. So one, uh, basically privileges uh, means that you can incentivize actors by giving those actors decision-making rights when those decision-making rights can be used to extract rent. So what do we mean by this? Um, one very simple example, if you create a block, then you have a certain amount of space, you have the ability to include transactions, and because you have decision-making power over whether or not to include transactions, other people can bribe you to basically do what, what they want you to do with that space, which is to include their transactions, and this is a source of revenue for you. And this is, a, even though you know, I use words like bribing and economic rents to describe it, in this case, this is actually a kind of desired behavior because, and it serves a dual purpose of kind of incentivizing people to, partic to participate in the protocol and also creating a kind of efficient market for transaction inclusion. Um, so 
Once again, incentives can be either rewards or penalties. So rewards, you know, if you do something good, then you can increase actors' token, token balances. And if people do something bad, then you can delete their tokens. Or you can, um, actually, instead, this should say instead of giving them privileges, it should say deny their future privileges. Right, so one example of denying future privileges is if an actor does something bad, then you can kick them out of the validator pool so they can't create blocks anymore. Um, so some important concepts in crypto economics. So one of them is uh, crypto economic security margin. So crypto economic security margin basically means that it's an amount of money X where you can prove about some system that even a so either some guarantee G about that system is satisfied or those at fault for violating that guarantee are poorer than they otherwise would have been by a margin which is equal to at least X. Um, so basically, either the system works or the system breaks, but some people pay for it. Um, crypto economic proof. So crypto economic proof basically means a message signed by an actor where because of the, the kind of way that the protocol works, you can interpret the message as kind of saying, I, I certify that either some claim is true or that I suffer, in, because I created this proof, I suffer an economic loss of at least size X. So, you can, I mean, one very practical example of what you would use a, a crypto economic proof for is in a Litecoin protocol, right? So if you can imagine that, you, that someone has the ability to create a transaction where they lose, uh, let's say, uh, 10,000 Ether unless the blo some block hash is equal to some value, and if you can prove that that property actually holds even without even having a whole bunch of recent information, then like, this is one way that you can make a light line protocol. Because if someone sends you one of these proofs, then you know either that claim is true or that claim is false, but they paid a million dollars to trick you. And generally, people are not going to be willing to pay a million dollars to trick you. Um, now, next thing we can talk about is we can talk about various different security models. So there's generally three kinds of security models that we think about.